Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Dominus Asks in Depth. For those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight, Dominus Asks is a good news, good vibes website that was launched two years ago. Our anniversary is actually upcoming, and um, we seek and try to um, spread the word of God and uh, just inspire everyone to love Christ every day in every way. And In Depth is our humble attempt at inspiring our viewers, our followers, to have a deeper understanding of the faith. And with me, of course, as always, is Father Jason. Father Jason, would you like to just briefly tell our viewers as we begin our second season of In Depth, what this second season is going to be all about. Here's Father Jason. Hello, hello, Margot, and to our viewers of Dominus S. Now, how time flies, no? Uh, tempus fugit. <laughs> time flies very fast, and now we are on our second season. Last season, we talked about the 500 years of Christianity. We focused basically on uh, looking back at history, no? to what happened in the first days of uh, uh, the arrival of Christianity in the, in the country. But now, on the second season, we will try to focus more on the, I think, the greatest event that can happen, that will happen this year and uh, in the next two years, and that would be the Synod of Bishops. So the second season, we will focus basically on uh, the Synod called by the Holy Father, Pope Francis, uh, for a synodal church communion participation mission and how exciting it would be exciting times indeed and um for those of you who missed the um, parts of the first season, you will now be able to view all of these on our YouTube channel. So please just subscribe to the YouTube channel of Dominus S. So it's Dominus S P H. And um, just very briefly, um, as we continue to celebrate 500 years of Christianity, you will see um, our episodes on the first on the Franciscans, Augustinians, Dominicans. Um, Recollects and of course the who am I missing the Jesuits yeah. <laughs> Pope Francis Pope Francis order yes so so just just tune into that go to our YouTube channel to catch all of the previous episodes and now we look as we look to the next five hundred years we have with us um, no less than the papal noon show for today's uh, episode for our launch episode and I have been tasked by Father, uh, I was given the honor <laughs> uh, by Father Jason to introduce our guest for today. So um, we were so blessed to be introduced to him last year. Actually, he, we, we saw that uh, he celebrated his appointment a couple of weeks ago, uh, his appointment as Apostolic Noon Show to the Philippines. And if I could just give a brief background so that our audiences would get to know him uh, a little better. Uh, he is a New Yorker, proud New Yorker. He took up his, um, but he took up his BA in history. So perfect for 500 years of Christianity at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. And then uh, he is such an intellectual. He <laughs> took up a ma his Master of Arts in Theology at the University of Oxford. <laughs> and then he went to Canada for another master's, this time in medieval studies. He really loves history uh, mm -hmm. from the University of Toronto. And then another master's, this time in divinity, uh, back in New York at the St. Joseph Seminary in Yonkers. <laughs> I haven't been to Yonkers. Uh, then he went to Rome for another doctorate, uh, for his doctorate in sacred theology at the Pontificio Ateneo San Anselmo. So for the Ateneans, <laughs> Archbishop yeah. Brown is also an Atenean, but in Rome. And um, he was uh, ordained to the priesthood in St. Patrick's Cathedral for the Archdiocese of New York way back in 1989. And then he was parochial vicar in St. Brendan's Church in the Bronx, like Jenny from the block, <laughs> before becoming officer of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith for 17 years. But Archbishop Brown, you look so young. Yeah, so thank you very ladies much, and gentlemen, <laughs> to formally welcome Archbishop Brown, thank Father you. Jason. 
Yes, uh, dear okay. viewers of Dominus Cest, I have the honor and privilege for our second season to introduce to you our special guest, our Apostolic Nuncio to the Philippines, Archbishop Charles John Brown. Welcome, Archbishop. Thank you, Father Jason. Thank you, Margo. I'm so happy to be with you again. I, I love Dominus Est, and congratulations on your coming up to your second birthday. Um, you look very young also, so we're, we're all trying to look young today. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's great, really. I'm so happy to be with you, and we're talking today, I think, about the Synod, but I'll let you introduce that theme. Um, on the second season of uh, Intep, uh, we, we intend really to um, hype up to raise awareness uh, because this synod, I believe for me as a, as a priest, as a pastor, uh, is something so significant. And I think this is also where the church is moving no? this uh, third millennium. As Pope Francis said, no? uh, this is the path that we shall take for the third millennium. So offhand, Archbishop, uh, may we know what basically is synod and synodality? Okay, this is a, a, a great theme. We could have a long conversation about it, and we certainly will. Um, how to begin to talk about uh, synod and synodality? I, I think, let me begin with the, the most easy description of a synod. A synod, um, in, in the most common usage of the term, is a gathering of Christians in order to discern the will of God in the light of the Holy Spirit in a particular situation. And probably the first example of a synod that we have in the church's history, although it's not called a synod, was in the Acts of the Apostles in the 15th chapter, when the apostles and the others gathered in Jerusalem to decide about whether or not Christians who had come from a, a Greek non-Jewish background would be required to follow the Jewish law as Christians. So this is the first example of a synod. Another word for synod is council. So really, in, in, the, in our language as Catholics, synod and council uh, are almost synonymous. They really mean the same thing. Yeah. The word synod is interesting. I want to Let me just talk to your viewers a little bit uh, about the word, because the word is interesting. It's a Greek word. Um, and it, in its original meaning, I just told you that it means a group of Christians discerning the will of God in the light of the Holy Spirit. But the original meaning of a synod is the idea of a caravan. What do I mean? A group of travelers going together on some kind of journey. And in fact, the word uh, synodo um, or synodia appears in the, the New Testament in the Gospel of St. Luke. When Remember when the baby Jesus was lost in the temple in Jerusalem? Mary and Joseph then left Jerusalem. They were headed, headed back to Nazareth, and they realized that the child Jesus, he's not a baby actually, he was 12 years old, wasn't with them. And here's what St. Luke says. He, it says, that um, when those days were over and they returned home, uh, that's Mary and Joseph, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware that he had stayed there. Then the next line, this is in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 2, verse 44. Assuming that he was in their company, they traveled on for a day before they began to look for him among their relatives and friends. That word company, in, in, the, in, the, in the original Greek is sunodia. So a, people journeying together like a caravan, a company of travelers. And that is the original meaning of the word synod, um, which comes to mean for us as Christians, Christians coming together to discern where to go and how to go forward on the path that leads to eternal life on our journey. And I'll say one more thing, and I'll let you uh, come back with some more questions. But, you know, all of you uh, who have cars or have scooters have the um, Other meter that, me that measures the uh, amount of distance that your scooter or car has taken, right? And I won't embarrass you by asking what's the name of that meter. Does anyone know? Uh, what do you call the, the little thing that gives you the number of miles that's your, or kilometers that your scooter or your car has gone. 
It's called the odometer. Od od odometer. 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 Ah. And it's the same <laughs> word as, as synodo, synodo, because synodo is shin, which means together, and hodos, which means the way, odos. So the odo at the end of synod is the same as odo in odometer. It's the way, mm -hmm. the path, how far we've gone. So anyway, this is what the synod is. It's a way in which all of us who are traveling together discern how to go forward. And um, Father Jason actually gave me a copy of the preparatory document. And I love how there it's also mentioned. It makes reference to um, how in the when Jesus was preaching, it wasn't just Jesus Christ and the apostles, but they also emphasize the importance of the crowd. And it said there that without the crowd, the apostles' relationship with Jesus becomes corrupted into a sectarian and self-referential form of religion. Is that kind of where we're going with this? Uh, I love how there's an emphasis on the, on the people and the crowd. Yeah, great, great, great point, Margot. I mean, so let me just say that this synod that will be held in two years' time, which we will begin very shortly, um, with uh, the Pope's celebration in the Paul VI audience hall and then the opening mass on the 10th of October. This synod is, is really one in a long series of synods that, that have been held in Rome since the Second Vatican Council. In fact, this is number 16 um, in the synod process for a synodal church communion, participation, and mission. But it's number 16, and there's actually been other synods that are not numbered that were extraordinary synods, special synods that were held also. Now, in most of these synods, the emphasis has always been on the bishops as the authentic teachers of the faith, gathering and discerning the will of God. But here, and Margot makes this really wonderful point, the idea is to broaden the consultation in this 16th synod and have a synod that involves not only the bishops, but, a, but really we're trying to uh, involve the entire people of God, the entire Catholic people, throughout the entire world. So it's a very ambitious project, especially in the time of COVID, but it's a, a project that will begin on the diocesan level with listening sessions, um, which will then be later on incorporated into a continental based reflection. And then finally will culminate in Rome with the holding of the Synod in October of 2023 when um, there will be the final meeting of the bishops in Rome. But the idea is to listen to, I mean, the, the crowd, okay, uh, I, I would say, you know, the crowd, of course, is the crowd listening to Jesus and the Gospels. The, the crowd of, of, of Catholics would be all of us in the church as sons and daughters of God. And the idea is to listen to the voices of everyone and to discern the will of the Holy Spirit in the light of everybody's experience. Yeah, connecting this crowd with, uh, in the catechism, the census fidei and that census fidei. Uh, yeah, many, um, perhaps many people are, are not aware of it, but can we just explore it, the, the idea of the census fidei and uh, yeah, how thank important you. it thank is you, in Father. the process? This is really uh, very, very important, and I'm glad you've raised that. Um, this, it's a very important uh, part of this synod process. Is now, what is this, this famous census fidei or census fidelium? So census fidei literally, the first one, is sense of the faith. And what does it mean? It means kind of an instinct, a sixth sense of the faith. All of you who are baptized, who are part of the people of God, have been given the gift of faith. And that it then evolves in you into a kind of a sense of the faith, an instinct for the faith. So that's the sensus fidei. The sensus fidelium would be that sense held by all the faithful. So this instinct for the faith that all the baptized have, this kind of supernatural sense, um, this kind of sixth sense of the faith, and with the many examples of it, you know, Jesus talks about um, the good shepherd, the sheep hear his voice. If another voice speaks, then they will not follow the, uh, the mercenary or the, the, uh, the anti-shepherd. They follow the, the voice of the shepherd because they have a sense 
of his voice. That's what this sensus fidei is. The sense of the voice of Jesus that we all have because we have been baptized. And you know, there's a beautiful document. It's long, it's quite complicated, but it was published by the International Theological Commission back in 2014 on this concept of the sensus fidei, sensus fidelium. And I would really encourage your, your, your viewers and listeners to take a look at it. It's really a wonderful document. You can Google it, International Theological Commission, which is a commission, actually, I will say in parentheses, I was the adjunct secretary of that commission when I was working in Rome. It's a commission of theologians that are nominated, appointed by the Pope in order to explore different theological concepts. And this idea of the census fide is really important because, you know, sometimes very we say uneducated Catholics who've had basic catechism, if someone preaches to them some kind of nonsense, um, they know this is not Catholic faith. You know, they, they have a sense of the faith. They have this, this instinct for the faith. And what the synod wants to do is kind of tap into this instinct of faith that all the people have and listen to the entire people of God as much as possible in order to discern the way forward. So really it's having great confidence in this instinct of faith. And the Second Vatican Council says that that instinct of faith is infallible, it can't fail. That instinct of faith, which is what was believed and is believed everywhere, always, and by everyone. This is our Catholic faith that every simple believer, every one of us holds and the job of the bishops is to encourage people to, how should we say, to mm, appreciate the gift of faith and to share it. So, and that's what the synod will be all about. Yeah, and that, I think it's the, the key, the key uh, concept in the whole synodal process. You're totally um, right, Father Jason. You're totally and, right about it. And that. perhaps, Archbishop, we would like to. I was part. I am now part of a team in the Archdiocese of Manila that is preparing the Archdiocese for the synodal process, but. Um, we were thinking, we were asking ourselves, maybe you can help us and even our viewers. How do we draw it, that, that's, that sixth sense of the faith among the faithful? How do we, how do we um, let's say, and tap, it out and tap it? Um, I mean, this is the revolutionary challenge of this synod, because what, what we're trying to do here really has not actually been done before. Um, so there is something very new about it, very innovative. Um, and um, so the question that you're asking, Father Jason, which is the excellent, what is these, as we say, the $64,000 question, how to do this? Now, obviously, the way we're going to do it is by listening, by convoking groups um, in the, on a diocesan level at the in the first stage, and then incorporating those later on into a continental level, then finally in the universal level in Rome in 2023. But I think one important thing is to, is to listen and try to listen to every sector um, of Catholic society, of, of, the, of the people of God. You know, there are, there are groups that oftentimes get excluded because we don't want to listen to them. And um, so I think the, the importance is, is listening and allowing people to express um, their vision for the church uh, in our time and where we need to go forward. You know, it, it's, it, it's important to make the distinction that with the, the census fidei sense of the faith is something that we all hold together. So individual believers, you and me, can make mistakes about our faith. You know, we can think, oh, you know, I can have a, a confused idea of the faith myself personally, but the body of believers as a whole, the people of God as a group, the mystical body of Christ is infallible in holding the Catholic faith. So each of us, when we contribute to a listening session, have to realize that, you know, I'm not the, the sole possessor of this census fide. I'm sharing this with all my brothers and sisters, and I may have confused ideas um, that need to be purified and need to be elevated by my discussion with others. So I think really authentic listening um, to every voice, you know, even the voices that we don't want to listen to um, uh, is very, very important in this process. 
Speaking of listening, um, in the 2019 Synod in Panama, um, Pope Francis also emphasized, I, I've, been watching, I've been watching a lot of uh, YouTube clips, and um, say, uh, Pope Francis was, um, uh, he was really emphasizing how we need to listen even to indigenous peoples and cultures and to try to uh, um, appreciate and accept them and listen to them. He was also big on the word discernment. And mm -hmm. uh, even in this document that was given by Father Jason, maybe that's how to extricate and how we must be always guided by the Holy Spirit um, yeah. as we do this discernment. Sure. No, that's that's the key, Marco. I mean, the discernment is the is what we're going to do. We're going to listen in order to discern. Because, you know, in a conversation, in, in eliciting the census fidei of the people of God, um, there will be there'll be divergent voices. Let's be honest. There will be divergent voices. And what is discernment? Discernment is seeing in this divergence the commonality of the faith and the the continuing authenticity of our faith. So that's what discernment will be. It will be kind of making um, how should we say a harmonious symphony out of what can be kind of dissonant voices at times. That's what discernment is, and that's not easy, and that requires the gift of the Holy Spirit. Will he be tackling, um, or will the synod, uh, as we listen to people around the world, uh, will we be tackling um, a, a, a gamut of issues, or is there going to be just specific themes as, as it was in the past? No, I think, Margot, it's going to be, there will be a, a lot of issues here, because there really isn't any uh, set theme except synodality itself. So the idea is to listen and to discern the way forward. So I think we can expect a multiplicity of themes and proposals and ideas from this that will uh, need to be discerned. So and I think you know from, from the environment to the liturgy, to language, to the role of women, to um, poverty, uh, to all of these issues I think will, be, will come up in this. In Fratelli Tutti, it seemed that Pope Francis already addressed so many issues from um, corruption <laughs> to, you know, world leadership to uh, the internet. But uh, Archbishop Brown, what do you think are the top topics, maybe as we um, look towards the next um, episodes of Dominus S, wherein we'll, we'll also be, we'll seek to have these dialogues as well. Um, maybe we could get your advice on what, yeah. what, the, what the best topics would be for us to explore since um, we're just laying it out now anyways. Yeah. And maybe we could seek your guidance yeah, for that's that. Great. That's, no, that's a really good question, Margo. I, you know, I think, the, I mean, the critical issue always for the church, um, the, the, the one thing necessary, the unum necessarium in Latin, is evangelization. That means um, mission, as you know, as Pope Francis says in this, uh, in, 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 in for the synod, um, mission is 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 key, and I think we need to think um, about the way in which we evangelize, because since the Vatican Coun Second Vatican Council, there's been a lot of talk about the new evangelization and the old evangelization. Um, I think we need to think very creatively and look at experiences throughout the world of where evangelization has been successful. I mean, I just say, you know, uh, we, there's no doubt that evangelization in, in Africa in the last 30 years has been enormously successful, enormously successful, you know. Uh -huh. um, evangelization in, in Europe, let's be very honest, has been less successful, uh, a lot less successful. Philippines has been, you know, quite successful also in, in evangelizing, and I think we need to look at um, the, 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 how should we say, the multifarious experiences of the church throughout the world and try to see what are the best ways in order to go forward um, as Catholics and to evangelize. Um, so I think that will be a very key thing here um, in this discussion. It's so important. I mean, you know, every culture is different. Um, and I, as I said, you know, I think that in, 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 in some, if we look at the evangelization in Africa since the Second Vatican Council, it's been an enormous, incredible success. Um, it's been less successful in other parts of the world, let's be honest. And I think that we have to think about how we evangelize um, and um, what are the principles for evangelization and how can we make 
the message of Jesus, the message of, of eternal life attractive to people in, in various cultures. Yeah. And, and Archbishop, also when it comes to mission, which is uh, also we're celebrating the, the month of mission. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, nowadays, really, that the challenge is not just not, not to proselytize, as the Holy Father would always say, not to pro- proselytize, but to really to uh, the joy of the gospel to be shared to, to all. Let me just backtrack a little, Archbishop, when it comes to why, why was you know, the synod on synodality chosen by the, the Holy Father as the theme for, this, for the synod? Um, there could be many topics, as Margot said, no, that are very relevant. But why, why now? No, why, why is this the agenda for the Church of the Third Millennium, uh, this synod and synodality? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think that, I mean, when I, maybe I'm with, I'll be with Pope Francis in about two weeks' time, and I can ask him exactly <laughs> why, he did, why he chose this. But, you know, I think it's, I think it, it's kind of what we've been discussing. I think that all these other synods, uh, you know, 15 synods up to this one, and plus the extraordinary synods, which are another, another three or four, all of them had a set theme um, set by the Holy Father. Um, on which uh, the church reflected, which is a wonderful and, and, and very productive uh, way of doing the synod. But I think this time he wanted to kind of change the process and see what results. Um, we've been doing it this way um, since the Second Vatican Council. In fact, you know, the first synod, I think it was certainly in the 1970s. Um, the first synod was, I can look at my notes here, it was back in 1967. So 1967 was the first synod, um, and that was quite a while ago, 1967. Um, And now I think what the Pope wants to do is really have an experience where the entire church sets the agenda, you know. And so the agenda will be set by a huge experience of dialogue and listening and discernment and to see where the Holy Spirit leads us using this new methodology. So that's a a revolutionary or the the innovative thing about this synod is that the methodology itself, the way it's being done is different. So I think that's the that's the key here. And it'll be very interesting to see how it goes and how it goes how it goes forward. We could move on and start exploring the different topics of Pope Francis, those that are that are close to his heart. uh, Archbishop Brown, Father Jason, he joined us for one of the Franciscus episodes uh, of the CBCP mission in collaboration with Dominus S. And he spoke about Evangelii Gaudium. Um, but there are other issues that seem to be very close to his heart. Like in Fratelli Tutti, he was very big on um, understanding people of different faiths. Uh, he has also he's all, he also always mentions migrants and. Um, there has also been, as a woman, there has also been a lot of talk on um, uh, empowering women within the Catholic Church. So I, I don't know, Archbishop Brown, uh, what what do you think um, should we explore? Well, I think, um, Margo, I think that these are all issues that are certainly going to come up in the different sessions that go into this synod. Um, all of these t- types of issues, uh, you know, mi- migration, uh, corruption, the role of women and others will certainly be topics. And it's, you know, it's a bit hard to prioritize them. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing we were saying earlier about the, the key of evangelization of mission, um, I think the church, I think, needs to look um, at herself uh, and to discern what the Holy Spirit is saying, also in terms of as we say, the different roles in the church, um, you know, and, and to what extent, and this is, I think, a, the, big, the big and somewhat difficult question, to what extent are roles in the church similar and different from roles in society? Um, so, you know, it's, um, I think, you know, Pope Francis has been very clear about um, the, the traditional reservation of priesthood, of ministerial priesthood to men. Um, and that, you know, is, is not something that we can expect to change in. Um, and so I think those present difficulties for us at times, those, those, that, that teaching in particular. I know Margot and I have talked about that before. Um, it, it presents difficulties because we want to empower women and allow women to, to, to flourish in the life of the church. 
and yet we have um, we have the, a, a, a tradition going back to, to Jesus and a truth going back to Jesus, which has a um, an implication for different roles for men and women in the church, and that is somewhat in tension at times with some societies. Because when we talk about you know role of women in society, um, you know, are we talking about the role of women in society? You know, in uh, in Nigeria, uh, in Costa Rica, you know, in Albania, in Japan. I mean, these are all different. <laughs> so um, I think it, I, this is where discernment is very very important. But I think also um, we as Christians need to give a reason for the way in which we live as Christians. So I think we need to be able to explain in a in a beautiful, convincing, loving manner why, for example, only men can become priests. And I think that and I've said this many times before, and you know, I think it, we need to to truly value um, different roles um, in the church. So I think I've said this before, and it and, and maybe people don't believe me, but and I said this I think in one conversation with Margot that you know being a Catholic mother. Uh, and it, evangelizing your children. I mean, there's no missionary activity that's more effective than that. I mean, all of us are basically, the four of us uh, are Catholic because of our parents, um, you know, and they are the ones who evangelize us and our mothers are so important in that. Um, you know, so, and I think that sometimes we kind of undervalue that and we think that um, for, a, uh, for, for a woman to be empowered, it means she needs to have an incredible, a big important job in a, in a corporation or something like that, yeah. which I, you know, a big, a, an important job in a corporation is a good thing and she can do a lot of good, but um, raising a Catholic family, and that's true for husbands as well as wives, is so important. It's the key to evangelization, really. It's just like in government, you don't have to be president. The great role that you play is a citizen. And sure. I, I guess Absolutely. this also goes back to when, um, at the launch of Dominus S, Father Jason, remember, it was we were launched at the Pista ng Mission, Feast of the Missions. And mm -hmm. um, the theme then was baptized and sent. And we were reminded that everyone who is baptized is, is sent. Mm -hmm. And it goes also to the to the theme of um, 500 years of Christianity, of gifted, of being gifted to give. Each each one of us is gifted to give. Okay. That's so yeah. Oh, so we're very excited for this. And um, Archbishop Brown, maybe just to um, encourage, um, how, how, will we, how will we encourage um, each person who is baptized um, to participate in this synod? Because not sometimes you, the impression is that only people who are active in church or those who are chosen can participate in this. But if there's, you know, a random Margot <laughs> uh, anywhere uh, that would like to somehow participate, uh, what can we do? How, what, what, can, what can an ordinary um, Catholic who's who would like his or her voice to also be heard and to contribute. What can he or she do to participate in this in this great um, effort of Pope Francis to make everybody heard? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. You know, I think remember that every single diocese is supposed to have a, a kind of a, a process of listening and discernment. So, if no matter where you are uh, throughout the world um, and and you want to participate, I would encourage you to make contact with your diocesan office and say. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a high school student, I'm a college student, I'm a grandmother, um, and I know that this process is going on. I'd love to be included um, as a voice in my diocesan discernment. Um, you know, make an effort, make contact, because every diocese will be doing something um, in these next couple, of, next year, basically. Um, and this is the reason, Archbishop, why we are having this interview with you, because we want really to reach out to, uh, let's say, the peripheries. And those sure. who are not uh, exactly seen within the church perimeters and uh, those who are not actually active inside the ministries. But, you know, as Margot would say, uh, the ordinary uh, Christians and even non-Christians, right? Sure. Uh, we need to reach out to them also. We and do, listen. we do. Yeah, we need to really uh, have as, you know, as much participation as possible. But um, yeah, so every diocese will be doing something, but for those of you who are listening to us and participating in our conversation today, uh, and you want to participate, talk, call, send an email to your diocesan office, to your, to your bishop, to your chancery, and say, you know, I'd love to be part of this process, um, because we are trying to include as many people as possible. Now, of course, we're under the constraints of the COVID pandemic, 
which does uh, restrict us to some degree, but it could be something where consultation is going on via Zoom or other online uh, media platforms. But then another thing to do for all of you uh, is to pray, because we need to pray that the God's Holy Spirit really inspires this process at every level so that it really is productive and fruitful for the church in our time. So um, whether or not you participate by giving your voice, and I hope you do, um, you can also participate by praying for this process, which is very, very important. What about Archbishop for those who are, like Father Jason mentioned, who either may not be Catholic or may have been somehow along the way discouraged to even be in church? Uh, how, how, but they would like their voices to be heard because there are some issues that have maybe been keeping them from, from coming from coming to church, uh, how, how, for us, how do we reach out to them? Or if they're listening now somehow and they get wind of this, um, how, how would they participate? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, I mean, there could be people who, who are alienated from the church, marginalized from the church, who want to participate. And those people, if they're listening to us, you know, I would say, make contact, um, make contact with your, with your local parish or with your, your local diocese saying, I'm, um, I've been alienated from the church, but I'm so encouraged by this process. I want to be uh, involved in it. So I think, you know, um, that's one thing we can encourage people to do that. Then also, I think every diocese, when they devise uh, and come up with their, their program for consulting and discerning and listening, they need to think creatively about how can we get to places where we're not really inviting participation. Like maybe there's, you know, maybe there's a, pri a big prison in my diocese and, um, and there are uh, female or male prisoners that we can consult too about their experience of church um, and, and involve them. So I think we can, I think both are necessary. I think we can, we need to, uh, be very creative in our diocese in the diocese in terms of finding ways to interact and consult people. But then also people who are listening to us, um, take the initiative yourself because chances are, if you don't take an initiative, we're not gonna find you. So please uh, raise your hand uh, symbolically by sending an email or talking to your parish priests or writing to the diocese or something to, to make your voice heard. Archbishop, before we end perhaps, uh... As some people are thinking, not, not just some, but many people are thinking, well, you want to listen to us? Are you ready for us? Are you ready for us? Uh, for example, the clergy, uh, the hierarchy, if you want to listen to us, are you ready for our voice? Uh, something like that. Uh, is that an issue for, for this? Scene? I don't think it should be an issue. I mean, I think the answer is, of course, we're ready to listen. Um, the bishops are ready to listen. I think it's important, as I said earlier, to realize that this listening is part of a discernment process. And, and as I said earlier in our conversation, the sensus fidei is not the sole possession of me or you. So if I come with my, you know, with my experience um, and I explain it and, and I'm listened to with compassion and love and respect, um, that that's one thing. It doesn't mean that everything that I think the church should do will then be done, you know. Um, so I think we're, we're, the church is going to listen and, and then discern uh, all of these voices in order to see where the Holy Spirit is leading us. So I think that bishops should not be afraid to listen. Um, but on the, under, on the other hand, people who are speaking should not think that because I've expressed my view, then everybody has to do it. I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that would be a mistake as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, Archbishop Brown is somebody who has um, been with and who is going to be with Pope Francis again soon. Um, could you just share with us uh, what he's really like and maybe how he listens? Well, you know, you know, Pope Francis is is a pope who's really, from the beginning, tried to go to the peripheries and to listen. And this is really part of this synod process to listen to people who are not being listened to. Um, and that's really the beautiful thing about about what he's trying to do here. Um, I always, you know, I was a nuncio in the country of Albania, a wonderful small country in Europe, before I came here. And it was the first country in Europe. That Pope Francis visited after obviously Italy because he's Pope in, in, in 
as the Diocese of Rome. Um, but after Italy, where, where he lived, he was made Pope, the first country he went to was the small, one of the smallest uh, countries in Europe. So kind of going to the periphery um, and, and listening is really, really important for him. And we see that again and again uh, in what he's trying to do. And that's exactly what's happening right now with this synod process. And we'd like to also, um, since we have you here on Indef for the first time, we'd also like to um, hear about uh, your time, your 17 years with the International Theological Commission. Yeah, um, actually, Margot, I was uh, the, the adjunct secretary, the, uh, the technical secretary of that commission only for about two, two and a half years. Um, I worked in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the office that watches over Catholic teaching. Um, I did that for about 17 years. And near the end of my time in 2009, I believe, I was appointed as a secretary of the Theological Commission, the International Theological Commission, which is attached to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In fact, just the other day, the Pope uh, appointed a whole new group of theologians as part of the commission as it is now. But I only did that for about a little over two years from 2009, <clears throat> excuse me, until 2012 um, when I was made nuncio in Ireland before I went to Albania. And we're, we now, uh, of course, we're so blessed with Pope Francis, but we're blessed to actually have also um, Pope Emeritus um, yeah. Benedict. And Benedict, you sure. worked closely with him for such a long time. Could you tell <laughs> us also about him because um, he's like my dream interview. <laughs> okay, <laughs> of course, yeah. Archbishop Brown and uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. So can yeah, you tell us well, just a little I bit think, about him? I think he's, uh, you know, dear Margo, I think he's a little bit, he's a little bit too old now for interviews. Um, mm. uh, so I don't think we can expect an interview until, until we're all in heaven and we can interview him in the life of the world to come in heaven. We'll interview him there. But um, no, uh, you know, Pope Benedict is a, is a Pope Emeritus Benedict is a, uh, a priest and a bishop with a great love for the truth, with a radiant intelligence. I mean, he's someone who is very, very intelligent and very humble. I mean, I, I always say that, you know, people who are, who are as intelligent as, as, as Pope Benedict, um, they're intelligent enough to, to understand that they don't have all the answers. You know, it's a kind of a contradiction. People who are really intelligent have a humility about them. And that was the way he was, a really very humble, trying to seek the truth um, always. And um, that was really what I really loved about him and continue to love about Pope Emeritus Benedict, his love for the truth. Which goes back to um, synodality and um, right. speaking boldly and listening humbly. Absolutely. And, and he was a great listener but in both Pope Francis and Pope Benedict both were very good at listening, um, listening in order to discern. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the challenge in this synodal process to encourage all voices to speak um, and then to listen to them very, very attentively, very compassionately with the love of Jesus. And then to do on the basis of that, to see where the Holy Spirit is leading us at, the, at this moment in the, in the life of the church. And that, you know, is not an easy process. I think we have to realize that. And people can have um, hopes or even agendas, um, which may not be fulfilled in this synodal process. Mm -hmm. um, but the important thing is that all voices are listened to and that we, on the basis of those, really uh, seek to understand where the Holy Spirit is leading us. It's not a, a political process. It's not, not a political process. It's not, it's not a democratic process of who got the mo who got more votes. You know, if I get fifty one percent, you only get forty nine percent, then I win. That's not the way the synodal process works. Yeah. 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 Um, it, listening also goes to Cardinal Advincula because his um, motto is Adiam. Um, yes. And it's the theme also for World Communications Day. I understand for World Communications Day 2022. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. So I guess so uh, it's really a lot we, of listening. We, are, we, hope to, we hope to listen. And it, it's, I hope that many people are listening to Dominus Est, especially uh, uh, in our conversation today. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. And speaking of Dominus Est, um, could we also just uh, segue to... Um, Dominus asked this, it is the Lord. Uh, could you 
uh, share with us some of your thoughts on this phrase, Archbishop Brown? Well, it's a beautiful phrase. You know, it's the phrase of St. John um, to, to Peter when he recognizes Jesus after the resurrection. Um, it is the Lord, you know, um, and the, the Lord is present here. And I think that the, the, the job of, of all of us as Catholics is to say, Dominus S, the Lord is here. Here is the Lord. The Lord is present. Um, and he's calling you. Uh, he loves you. He is, gives you the gift of faith. You know, one of the things that, as I, you know, go through life, you realize is that wisdom, which is understanding why am I on this earth? You know, I've, I've said this many times before, but no one asked my permission to create me. You know, I didn't choose to come into this world. You didn't. Here you are. You're here. Um, and our Catholic faith tells us, tells us that the reason for your existence is God's love for you. Um, God has made you out of love and for a destiny of love. And the Lord's path is the way to this life of love. So I think it's, it's very important uh, for us to, 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 to listen, also to listen to the wisdom of the church, because none of us on our own have enough time in our lives to figure everything out. We rely on other people for everything, you know? I always think about, you know, if you took a group of people, you know, a self-sustaining population of people, a couple thousand people, and put them on a desert island without anything except their clothes, um, people who knew about modern society, who knew about the internet, who knew about cell phones, you let them live there, how long would it take for them to develop cell phones? You know, you know maybe five generations. Um, it would take a long, Never. long time because all... We, 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 we live on the basis of a tradition we've received from other people. Um, and the same thing is true for the church. The same thing is true for the church. Um, we, our, our faith comes from hearing, as, as, uh, as St. Paul says, from listening to the experience of others. And that gives us the wisdom. And it, it is the Lord, Dominus Est, who gives us this, this, this path to eternal life um, that we cannot create for ourselves, that we need to receive from the wisdom of the church. So those are some of the reflections I would have on, on Dominus Est. Just, just picking up from that before we um, end, uh, Pope Francis also emphasized, aside from um, hearing the different views, uh, different um, listening to different people um, and different cultures, different backgrounds, different issues, different problems, um, is how we should always also remember to go back to tradition and go back to our roots um, in spite of that. Um, could we just also explore um, that facet of this of the synodality about how um, it's not just voicing but also um, remembering the importance of um, our traditions, our going back to the word and the, and the basis of it all, so that we are not lost in our path as we journey together. That's so well said, Margot. I think you really that's beautifully expressed, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know. Um, the, the, the communion of saints, you know, it means that the church exists here on earth, the church exists, we believe in, in purgatory, and the church exists in heaven. Um, and all the souls in heaven are people who lived here before us. <laughs> Every saint is someone who lived on this earth before, 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 before us, and they showed us the way to eternal life, and they're, 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 they're now in eternal life and praying for us that we arrive there also. So um, the tradition of the church is very, very important. And the idea that we can somehow jettison the tradition and somehow find a path that is in contradiction to the tradition is, is, is always going to be a mistake for, for Catholics. Um, but we need to, to understand the tradition, love the tradition, and allow the tradition to lead us forward in ways that are always new. So this is the, the paradox, that tradition is always alive. It's not a dead thing. It's something that's living because the saints in heaven are alive and all of them, they're part of our tradition, you know, um, and we need to recognize that. So yeah, um, the, tradition is, is really important just because um, we're not born in a vacuum. We're not going to create everything 
ex nihilo means from nothing. We need to uh, live the tradition in a healthy, authentic, and joyful way. And that's the path that leads us forward. Yeah, Archbishop, I am really uh, so so edified and uh, inspired uh, uh, by this interview with you. And uh, maybe can I have a, a final question for you, Archbishop, before we finally uh, wrap sure. this up? Um, yeah. Because nowadays, really in the time of the pandemic, people are looking for some uh, sort of inspiration. And Pope Francis has been, uh, has been harping on a, a new organizing principle, not just in terms of individualism, but uh, in terms of fraternity of, uh, of being. So um, maybe can you give some words of inspiration to our people today who are really in, in suffering uh, in the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, well, thank you uh, for, the, for that reflection and that, uh, that invitation, Father Jason. Yeah, I mean, I think we are all now quite weary from this COVID pandemic, which has been lasted longer than any of us would have expected. And you know, I think that in this uh, period of suffering for all of us and period of loss, because all of us, I imagine, know people who have, uh, who have died because of this virus. I certainly do. So it's been a period of, of, of suffering, a, a period of really walking in the desert, um, waiting for the end of this. But I think that in this desert experience, the Lord is also touching our hearts and making us understand perhaps that some of the things that we took for granted when things were fine and some of the, maybe the frenetic activities we were involved in running around here and there, some of it we might, on reflection realized was kind of wasting our time. And this desert experience of COVID has forced us in some ways to be a bit more contemplative because it's, we've been all sometimes even physically enclosed in our houses and apartments. So hopefully it's given us a, a greater appreciation of the interior life, the life of prayer. Um, so I think that there will be, um, there certainly will be a silver lining uh, to this cloud. Uh, but it's certainly been a time of suffering. I also believe that it will end. Um, I don't want to be overly optimistic, um, but it seems that after the Delta variant, it's so far, there seems to be nothing kind of coming after that. So as the Delta variant declines, God willing, we'll be seeing uh, the, 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 the end or coming to be the beginning of the end of this, of this COVID uh, crisis. So um, it's a time in which we need to pray and persevere um, and appreciate this, um, this period of suffering as somehow allowed by God, because it certainly was allowed by God, in order to uh, help us to perhaps focus on what's really important in our lives. It's really a time for us to journey together. In the document, that uh, preparatory document that Father Jason shared with me, it said, the pandemic, it's a global tragedy, um, but it momentarily revived the sense that we are a global community, all in the same boat where one's person's problems are the problems of all. And um, it, it brings us such comfort that Pope Francis is one with us. Uh, I remember the Holy Week um, wherein he was that very, very powerful image of him walking all alone uh, in St. Peter's Square uh, towards the St. Peter's Basilica. And we just take so much comfort in the fact that he has been such a great leader in this trying time and that he is truly journeying with each and, and every one of us. So as a Pope Francis um, representative here, thank you so much for that, Archbishop thank you, Brown. So, thank you. So and that's you, all the time. You can be have. very portrait, Archbishop. Can you bring to Pope Francis uh, our message of thank you? And appreciation. I will. I'll do my best. I will do that. Been will doing do that. to all of us, giving us inspiration. I will greet him on behalf of Dominus Est when I see him uh, in, in about two weeks. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank wow. you. Thank you, Archbishop. Thank you so much. And if um, Father Jason has uh, already lost a lot of weight and he might fit sure. into your luggage, <laughs> if that would be all right with. Uh, I would not mind, Archbishop. <laughs> That'd be great, Father Jason. That'd be fantastic. So maybe if Archbishop Brown, could we uh, end with a blessing from sure. our people, Lucio? Sure, sure. So let's ask uh, the angels, especially the guardian angels of each and every one of our listeners today, 
to protect them and to watch over them. Let's also pray to the saints in heaven, especially St. Joseph, whose year we continue to celebrate, and especially to Our Lady, the Mother of God, the one who received the word and gave flesh to the word. May Mary watch over each and every one of you, and may the blessing of Almighty God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. 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 So thank you so much. And to all our viewers, uh, thank you for joining us for the first episode for the second season of In Depth. Um, and may we all be inspired now. Uh, as we continue, we have to all re always remember we are baptized and set. And Father Jason? And thank you very much, Archbishop Brown, for being with us. And I hope our viewers uh, would take the challenge of journeying together as a synodal church. Thanks for watching. Right, thank you.